All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending both in person and virtually the special grand rounds version uh, of our recognition of um, World Asthma Day 2023. Before I introduce our speaker, I just have a really quick announcement. At the end of Grand Rounds, we will take a few minutes to recognize our 2023 CHP Asthma Champion awardees. So please stay tuned at the end of the questions. Our speaker today is Dr. Teresa Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert is a professor at the University of Cincinnati and the director of the Asthma Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center. She earned her MD from the University of Minnesota, where she also completed residency. Then she did fellowship at the University of Colorado and obtained a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Arizona. Dr. Gilbert has more than 20 years of experience providing clinical care to children and adolescents with preschool, childhood, and severe asthma, particularly those from disadvantaged populations. Dr. Gilbert has developed a telehealth clinic that serves several urban core school-based health centers. She also has significant expertise in clinical, translational, and epidemiological research. Her research incorporates stakeholder input from patients, families, schools, and community pediatricians to develop, implement, and test technology-based interventions for children with asthma. She's particularly interested in the risk factors and environmental exposures that lead or contribute to early childhood wheezing and to severe asthma, as well as intervention strategies for these patients. She has participated in the steering committees and collaborating with other center PIs in NIH-funded networks like AsthmaNet and the Severe Asthma Research Program, or SARP. She is currently the site PI for several multi-center asthma studies for both preschool and school-age children with asthma, including a study in which we're collaborating to identify genomic pathways that lead to obesity-related asthma. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Teresa Gilbert. Thanks so, nice, so much. Um, I, I actually grew up in Pittsburgh when I was young, so it's kind of like coming home. I grew up in a many, many, many years ago in a, in a, a small rental in Penn, uh, in uh, Squirrel Hill where my dad worked, uh, did a postdoc in Carnegie Mellon, and my mom got her PhD at UPET. So it's like a little bit like coming home again, and uh, reminds me a lot of Cincinnati because it's a city of neighborhoods and older homes and things like that. So very comfortable here. And thank you for that kind welcome. Um, and I'm so, super excited to present to you about a topic I'm passionate about. I've been thinking about preschool wheezing and the risk of asthma for, for many, many years. So happy to be here to talk about that this topic. Here are my disclosures. And so we're gonna talk about early life risk factors and phenotypes associated with children that go on and continue to have asthma symptoms as they get older and which phenotypes predict response to um, key controller medications and really kind of review the recent evidence for treatment of preschool wheezing and asthma. So we're gonna start with a case. I see this kid all the time in the hospital and I see this kid all the time in my clinic. So um, the one we're talking about today is a two-year-old black male currently hospitalized with recurrent bronchiolitis, a term I hate, um, who has one previous episode in the past year requiring hospitalization. When you talk, he's had at least four episodes in the uh, past year that the mom can think of. His trigger is always viral um, infection. It starts out with a runny nose, he gets a cough, and then he starts wheezing. In between these episodes, he looks great. He's running around and playing. He sleeps well. Couldn't tell that he has trouble with colds. Um, mom has asthma, and he's had eczema since a few months of age. So the question that I see all the time, whether we're in the hospital or in the clinic, is how should we manage this kid? So why are we talking about this anyway? Um, there's been an increasing prevalence of wheezing in preschool children. The incidence has actually tripled in the past 30 years. And 50% of preschool children experience one episode of wheezing before age six. And 40% of those go on to continue to have wheezing as they get older. Um, the children in the zero to four age group have twice the rate of outpatient physician visits, ED visits, and five times the rate of hospitalization. And the economic um, burden is substantial. It's, it was estimated to be around 3 billion in 2013. And I'm sure it's higher than that now. 
So what do I see um, in my clinical practice? Well, often I see parents that are frustrated. Um, their children have had multiple ED visits, hospitalizations for wheezing episodes before the management of preschool asthma is ever considered. They're often treated with multiple courses of oral steroids before a controller trial is considered. And I think we come at this honestly because the current bronchiolitis guidelines um, really don't talk about the risk of the child and what to do if someone has recurrent wheezing, even though I and other pulmonologists have advocated that we need a little section in there about risk. Um, we haven't been heard yet. <laughs> So um, what is bronchiolitis? Um, first, I want to sort of, you know, we sort of say toddler age wheezing around viruses, but in Europe, actually, their age limit is 12 months. And I think there's some good evidence for that um, because there is the viral etiology of bronchiolitis is very age dependent. So RSV is the predominant virus up to age six months. And then rhinovirus takes over from age 12 months and greater. And why is that important? Well, there's an increased risk of asthma um, or recurrent wheezing when you do wheeze with rhinovirus. So looking at uh, data from Matt, Madison, Wisconsin and other um, birth cohorts, we can see that there's a four to 26 fold increased risk of asthma if you wheeze with a uh, rhinovirus infection. And that's five fold greater than if you wheeze with RSV. Um, you also have a four fold risk of asthma if your mom has asthma a three to four fold risk if you have any atopic disease like eczema, and two to three fold risk if you have the presence of um, eczema at, at any point in your life. So, um, so bronchiolitis as defined by the current guidelines actually may include several different um, um, diseases with that common sort of umbrella clinical manifestation, but actually may represent different pathways, different responses to treatment and different prognosis. And so, my job today is really to try and help people sort of identify, oh, this is a simple wheezer who's probably not at risk to go on and develop recurrent wheezing or someone that's already at risk and showing this pattern. So um, this is sort of trying to answer, this study was trying to answer the chicken and egg. So what comes first? Is it you got the bad virus and you end up with recurrent wheezing or is it in, uh, in sensitization? Or is it that you're sensitized and then you end up wheezing with viruses? And so. This was a um, analysis of the coast birth cohort at the University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, over 280 children that were at high risk for allergic disease and uh, asthma because their parents had atopic disease. Um, these children had nasal lavage, culture, PCR-based viral diagnostics, air allergen sensitization annually for the first six years of life. And sort of the relationships between viral wheeze and sensitization was examined using a Markov model by uh, Dan Jackson and colleagues. So um, the way this analysis worked is if more patients went this route, started out with a viral wheeze and then end up sensitized with recurrent viral wheeze, that would suggest that viral wheeze comes first. If more children go from sensitization and then wheeze with viruses um, subsequently, it would suggest that sensitization comes first. And when they did these ratios, you can see that any um, virus, there's about a, almost a two-fold risk of patients following this sensitized first, and then they get viral wheezing path, um, then the viral wheeze to sensitization path. And when you look at human rhinovirus, it's over two times the risk. Interestingly enough, RSV, it almost was significant, but not quite um, for this pathway. So the, the conclusion was really that um, children seem to get sensitized early in life and that leads to this wheezing with, um, with viruses. So when does uh, preschool wheezing become asthma? And this is kind of, you know, I've heard it's age six, like that's a magic age. And really the guidelines say it's zero to four. I mean, really it's looking at these risks and trying to determine at what point we think it may be. So um, this is sort of the classic Tucson Children's Respiratory Study map of phenotypes um, that I still, I still use this in my clinic, trying to figure out what, what bucket somebody might land in. Um, and so there's sort of the classic transient wheezer here in purple, where they start wheezing the first few months of life, but usually by age three, they're done wheezing. And they're associated with, if you test lung function in infancy, they're lower. They're exposed to maternal smoke, typically. Um, they still have decreased lung function as they get older, but their airways are big enough they don't seem to wheeze anymore. Um, and then if in uh, uh, yellow color is a non-atopic group. So this group starts out wheezing around age two, but by the time they hit middle school, they're sort of done wheezing with viruses. 
They often only wheeze with viruses, not in between. They don't have, they have the classic exercise nighttime symptoms between these episodes, and they have bronchohyperresponsiveness. Um, and in green, we have our atopic wheezers. They, they tend to start wheezing at age two. They continue to wheeze as they get older. Um, they, they typically have the classic family history of atopic disease. They have eosinophilia, um, usually 4% or greater, eczema, and allergic rhinitis. And there's also some risk models for asthma. So, um, you know, the retrospective maps, we're sort of looking backwards, right? We're sort of to the following over the lifespan, what happened to kids as, um, as they get older. And that's hard to, you know, is that really a phenotype? If you're not seeing it in the clinic, it's kind of retrospective. It may not be it's so helpful in clinical practice. So several risk models have been developed, which are trying to help people look forward, like try to predict the risk of that child. Um, and the core of what they include is typically, is the kid sensitized? Do they have a parental history of asthma? Is, and what's the severity and the frequency of asthma? Because those all play into risk. And so one of the, I just picked out two, there's like something like 30 models. I keep reviewing them for up, there's an up-to-date review article on this topic. Um, and so I picked the two most popular that I see. One is the pediatric asthma risk score. This is actually developed in, in Cincinnati in the Hershey lab. Um, using epidemiologic data. There's an app for it. There's a website for this. So I know my residents carry it around in their phone because I've drilled it into them. If you have somebody who's been hospitalized a couple of times, check their risk. Um, and the, the things that they look for is parental asthma, eczema before age three, wheezing apart from colds, wheezing before age three, um, African-American race, which I think is a surrogate for um, red line districts and all the other uh, risk factors and disadvantages that we have um, in this country. And then skin pricked positive, um, either to two or more food or um, aero allergens. And all that adds up to a risk that stratifies you into low risk for developing, uh, having a diagnosis of asthma at age seven, moderate or high risk. So again, it's a way to sort of determine is this kid in front of you likely at risk to continue to wheeze. And then there's a classic asthma predictive index. Um, which was developed from Tucson-based uh, data. The original asthma predictive index, um, typically it's a frequent wheezer, so that they have four or more uh, wheezing episodes in their life, and they either have one major criteria, a physician diagnosis of asthma in a parent, or a physician diagnosed eczema, or they have two minor criteria. The physician thought that they had allergic rhinitis. They wheeze apart from colds, like around grandma's smoking cat. Um, or they have eosinophilia of at least 4%. And then this got modified as part of the um, uh, prevention study, which I'm gonna show you some data for. So uh, in that study, it was a multi-center clinical trial. There was a lot of allergists that were part of that study. And they said, well, what the heck is physician diagnosed allergic rhinitis? We need to make this a little more objective. So basically they took the four wheezing episodes a year, added um, objective allergic sensitization to what, at least one air allergen as a major and um, allergic sensitization to the most common food allergens, milk, egg, or peanut. So um, let's first look at treatment based on risk and status of atopic disease or allergic sensitization. And I'm gonna start with preschoolers that have a history of recurrent wheezing, but don't have persistent disease, meaning they wheeze with colds, but in between they look great, which is a lot of preschool wheezing. So first we're gonna look at intermittent therapy. First, I'm gonna start out with the maintenance intermittent inhaled corticosteroid and wheezing toddler or MIST trial. This is part of the, the CARE network. Um, and this was a 52-week study of over 270 children. They were aged 12 to 53 months. They had a history of frequent wheeze. They had a modified asthma predictive index, which we just went over, past year exacerbation, and intermittent illness. So they did not have persistent disease. Um, they made it through successfully through a run-in that they were able to take their medication consistently, and they didn't have severe disease or persistent disease, and they enrolled in the trial. So they were either randomized to receive daily low-dose budesonide or intermittent high-dose budesonide. The daily low-dose budesonide group got budesonide 0.5 milligrams every single night. And during respiratory tract illnesses, they got a placebo nab in the morning. Um, and then they were given that uh, treatment for seven days. That was their sick plan. The intermittent high dose got placebo every night. And then during uh, respiratory tract illnesses, they got one milligram twice daily of budesonide for seven days. Um, 
the outcome of the study, or the primary outcome was time to first exacerbation. And what we can see is that the uh, percent of patients that required a course of prednisolone for a lower respiratory tract infection um, was right on top of each other. Um, and the average was about a little less than one per patient year um, over time. There were some differences though. Um, the, I mean, first there was no significant difference in episode free day, infant toddler quality of life, percent of days with albuterol use. You can see it was only about 5% because parents in this age group hate to use albuterol because it wires up their kid. So albuterol isn't quite as great an outcome in this group, age group as it is in older age groups. Uh, had similar exhaled nitric oxide levels, similar growth. However, there was a um, higher cumulative ICS exposure, about 104 milligrams, or a 3.3-fold greater uh, exposure with daily budesonide. So it didn't change our growth, but there's still a lot more exposure. Um, this is another study where we, this is a little controversial, and I, I usually get a, a rotten tomato thrown at me from the pediatricians in the office and the audience, but we actually looked at using um, azithromycin in the prevention of acute wheezing illnesses in preschool children. So why did we decide to do this study? Well, um, we thought we should figure it out because antibiotic use uh, for wheezing illnesses is not recommended by the guidelines, but we see a lot of it in practice. So a lot of uh, antibiotics are giving for wheezing episodes. And there's probably some reasons for that. Um, viruses are typically the most common trigger for acute wheeze, but bacteria have been shown to have an emerging role um, in pathogenesis and exacerbation risk. And macrolide antibiotics have been shown uh, to provide benefits in other inflammatory airway diseases like cystic fibrosis. And they actually have an antibacterial and an anti-inflammatory property. So after steroids, the most likely tool in the pulmonologist arsenal is azithromycin. So we use a lot of it. Um, and so the, this question, this study really asked, if we started azithromycin early in the onset of uh, cold, could we prevent um, lower respiratory tract illness in, in a child and uh, prevent progression of these episodes. So um, this was a study um, published in JAMA. It was a randomized double-blind placebo group trial um, of over um, 500 children. We used azithromycin at a pretty hefty dose. We used the strep, strep dose of 12 milligrams per kilo. Why do we use that dose? Because we didn't want to miss an effect. We didn't want to publish something, a negative study, and they would said, well, you should have used a higher dose. So we went with the higher dose. Um, this is how study design works, right? Um, so 12 milligrams versus placebo for five days. And we began it at the onset of each cold um, when the patient developed symptoms that the parents associated with them going on to develop wheezing. So it's a parent-directed asthma plan. Usually 90% of it was cough and runny nose, but a few patients had a few other like fever and some other symptoms. Um, so as soon as they saw those, that combination of symptoms, they would start the azithromycin and albuterol up to four times a day. Um, this study was originally supposed to be 52 weeks, but then we ended up with an RSV season that was super light. So we extended it to 78 weeks. So these kind of things happen in clinical practice. So it was actually a, a 78-week study for most of the kids. Um, our primary outcome was the number of respiratory tract illnesses that progressed onto a severe lower respiratory tract illness, and that was defined as needing over six albuterol treatments in a 24-hour period, um, patients that were, didn't um, improve after three back-to-back -back albuterol treatments in an hour, if they required albuterol more often than every four hours on two consecutive occasions, they still continue to have moderate to severe cough or wheeze for over five days or five or more days. They needed to go get healthcare utilization for the respiratory symptoms, or if the physician thought that their combination of symptoms did, um, needed that. So um, we're kind of looking at the progression of um, how many kids. So as soon as they got a, a lower respiratory tract illness, they dropped out of the study. So that was the end of the study for them. And so what we're kind of looking at is the cascade and the uh, placebo group, like how many kids made it to one cold, you know, one made it through one cold, two colds, three colds, four colds before they had to drop out. And you can see by the end, there was 57 kids in the placebo group that had to drop out of the study because they had a lower respiratory tract illness. On the azithromycin side on red, you can see that uh, 35 um, per uh, of them um, dropped out, so quite a bit less than the placebo group. And you can see as they sort of progress on, less and less 
people, um, you know, they, the, if they're going to drop out, they dropped out fairly early and very little dropped out by the third or fourth. So it really did seem to be fairly protective. When you sort of plot this a different way, looking at the cumulative risk to lower respiratory tract um, infection, you can see that the azithromycin group is quite a bit lower than the um, a, uh, placebo group after correcting for sort of the usual age, API status, and other things. Um, and then the hazard ratio was 0.64 protective for the use of azithromycin. So we did a subgroup analysis seeing if we could predict this effect based on genetics, ages, API status, and so on. And we really couldn't find significant differences in subgroups. Um, we also did a subgroup uh, azithromycin resistance at the University of Washington. So we took 81 subjects that got deep oral pharyngeal samples at baseline. And when they finished the last study medication, and it was 14 days after their last study medication dose, you can see at baseline, kids already um, had 12% and 9% of uh, azithromycin-resistant organisms. And by the final visit, it was 20 and 17. Some kids sort of switched over during the trial, whether they had organisms or not. Um, when we looked at the number of new acquisitions, you can see it was slightly higher in the azithromycin group at 16%, and the non-azithromycin group was 10%. So the summary I have is azithromycin, I started at the earliest signs of a cold, was effective in reducing the risk of experiencing episodes of severe lower respiratory tract illness. There was really no difference in API status and was well tolerated with low, low rates of adverse effects. If we saw anything, it was a little bit of nausea and vomiting. Um, and so we'll sort of, I'll sort of sum up what I think about that study and how I use azithromycin in my clinic. So the next thing I'm going to look at is, again, kids that don't have persistent asthma. And this was actually a prevention trial. Um, so this was back in, this, this trial started in 1999. So back then, people weren't really sure if we should be using inhaled corticosteroids in young toddlers. So this is going to seem like old news to you all because it got incorporated into the guidelines. But back then, people weren't really sure two-year-olds should be on inhaled corticosteroids. And there was some retrospective data that suggests the earlier you started inhaled corticosteroids, you might prevent the severity of asthma as you got older. So those were the sort of the background of this study way back in the day. <laughs> and uh, so this is a randomized multicenter double blind um, parallel group placebo controlled trial of 285 two and three year old children at high risk for asthma. So they had that modified asthma predictive index and they had a history of intermittent wheezing. And uh, they either got randomized to receive two years of treatment with daily low-dose inhaled steroids or placebo. Um, and so here, our, our um, primary outcome was an episode-free day. That means a day with no cough or wheeze, no healthcare utilization, and no use of asthma medications, including bronchodilator pretreatment before exercise. The inhaled corticosteroid group, which was flow, a low-dose flow, flow vent, is in blue, and in red is the placebo group. Um, looking at the ep number of episode-free days while on treatment, you can see that um, at baseline, most kids spent 5% of the time with, uh, with um, wheezing, right? And 95% of the time without, which is what I was talking about. They get these episodic kind of things. Um, the, when they were on inhaled corticosteroids, you can see that that treatment group really stayed at that level. But if you're in the placebo group, with time, you have more and more symptoms. And this is kind of what I see in my clinic. They start out intermittent, and with time, they get the classic asthma. I have trouble with exercise. I have trouble waking up at night. It takes time to develop that, and we usually see that around age six. And you can kind of classically see that natural history here. So it starts becoming significant um, You know, after about a year of treatment. You can really see the separation of the differences here. And during the observation period, pretty quickly after you come off inhaled corticosteroids, the, the symptom burden is right on top of each other. Um, and so it didn't prevent asthma, but it sure as heck did keep the kids uh, symptom free, or fairly symptom free while they're on it. Um, so that changed the guidelines. We started saying, hey, zero and four to year olds might benefit from using inhaled corticosteroids. During the treatment phase, we saw lower rates of exacerbations, lower need for additional asthma medications, um, but we saw similar bronchodilator use. Remember, parents of this age group hate to use albuterol, so we rarely see a difference in bronchodilator use, and we didn't see any difference in unscheduled visits. In the observation phase, all these secondary outcomes were right on top of each other. 
So how about preschoolers that already have mild persistent disease? And these kids exist. I see three-year-olds all the time that have a couple of days of symptoms. They wake up a couple of times at night each week. Um, they ask for their inhalers. That's always exciting when a three-year-old asks for their inhaler. Um, so these kids already have mild persistent disease and it does occur in young children. And so this was a study saying, okay, you qualify for step two controller, meaning you, need, you should be on a daily low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. So it was 300 children, 12 to 59 years of age. There was a run-in uh, two to four weeks to make sure they truly were um, uncontrolled and just albuterol alone. And this is a crossover study. So each child got exposed to one of three different active uh, treatments. So we could really sort of see what works best for, for each child. Um, and so for instance, this child might have started on active daily inhaled corticosteroids, which was Flovent 44, two puffs twice daily, and got placebo leukotriene receptor antagonist, which was monolucast, or as needed, uh, placebo inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and then uh, the outcomes were looked, so that sort of a, a wash in in the first eight weeks and the outcomes were looked at at the uh, last eight weeks. Then at the next treatment period, they would have gotten placebo inhaled corticosteroids, active daily uh, singular, and as needed um, placebo um, inhaled corticosteroids. Again, outcomes looking at that last eight weeks of that treatment period. And then the child would go on to placebo ICS, placebo leukotriene receptor antagonist and as needed um, active ICS, which is um, basically you used albuterol. Uh, every time you use two puffs of albuterol, you use two puffs of your flow vent until your symptoms disappeared. We got blood and urine sample collection for predictor analysis. And really the question of the study was which step two asthma therapy is the best for the greatest number of children that already have persistent disease. And we used a hierarchical composite variable for time to exacerbations and the number of asthma control days, because those are really important outcomes, I think, in this group. So we saw a differential response between one of these three treatments in at least 74% of the children, um, and 26% didn't show much of a difference. And so we're going to try and tease out who, who, who is who. Here And um, so the uh, probability of a response was much greater for inhaled corticosteroids and about equal for as needed inhaled steroids and leukotriene receptor antagonists. Um, and if you were a non-differential responder, the number of asthma control days, you can see you're overall really, really well controlled. So it's hard to see a difference when everybody's pretty well controlled on that side. So I think that was sort of the driver of if, if you didn't have much for symptoms, it was hard to tell a difference between the, the therapies. However, if you were a differential responder, you can see that there was less, uh, there was greater asthma control days if you were on inhaled corticosteroids, but leukotriene receptor antagonists and as needed inhaled steroids also, uh, also perform pretty equally. And down here, we're looking at the cumulative risk of an exacerbation. Again, if you're a non-differential, you hardly had any exacerbation. So again, hard to see a difference. But in the 76% that did have a differential response, you can see a lower risk of inhaled corticosteroid uh, followed um, by as needed inhaled corticosteroids and then um, leukotriene receptor antagonists. So what characteristics might predict these kind of responses? So here we're kind of looking at different things like aeroallergen sensitization, the number of uh, exacerbations you had, sex, uh, blood eosinophils and a combination of those. And you can see what really um, drove this is if the child had air, air allergen sensitization to one or more um, air allergens, you can see the effect was really driven by uh, a preferential response to inhaled corticosteroids. Similar effect if your blood eosinophils were 300 or greater at baseline. And then if you had both, you had an even more robust response to inhaled corticosteroid compared to the other um, two therapies. And similarly here, we're looking at cumulative exacerbation risk. Um, and you can see if you had error allergen sensitization, um, you had a lower risk on inhaled corticosteroids compared to the other two. Similar pattern in blood eosinophils and a potentiated effect again, if you had both sensitization and eosinophilia. And so, um, you know, my, my sort of advice looking at this study is if children have air allergen sensitization or eosinophilia, it probably makes a lot of sense to start inhaled corticosteroids. If they're not sensitized or don't have eosinophils, you could really pick any of those three. And that becomes a 
family, well, we always talk to the families, but, a, you know, that would be a family-centered discussion on which one makes more, the most sense to them. So what are the current guidelines? There's two, you know, there's NAEPP and GINA, so I'm going to kind of show you both. So NAEPP actually incorporated some of these studies that I was telling you about in 2020. So you can see in the zero to four age group um, that there's the as needed in um, uh, short acting beta agonist. And at the start of a respiratory tract infection, you do a short course of daily inhaled corticosteroids. Um, that's that MIST study that I was telling you about. Notice they don't put a dose here. Really the data is higher dose inhaled corticosteroids. So if, I, if you hear anything from me, I would say you want to have higher, you know, look at look at the categories of um, inhaled corticosteroids and the guidelines, like what's low, medium, high, pick a higher range of the inhaled corticosteroids for that seven day or so period until the symptoms disappear. Um, and then step three, um, we, you start to see that we have now added inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonists into the regime, which was not there before. Um, GINA also at step one, um, has intermittent uh, inhaled corticosteroids at the onset of a viral illness. Again, that missed study um, strategy. And then step two does daily low dose ICS. They, interestingly enough, don't uh, endorse ICS and LAVA in this age group. So, as usual, there's a little discrepancy between the two bodies. So, pick the one that you like. <laughs> you, you can say you're right. Um, and Gina does uh, keep an updated table of what would be considered low dose, and anything above this would be medium to high dose. Um, so what are the clinical messages that I have for, for you all um, after this? So I, I do can, um, use intermittent therapy quite a bit for high-risk children that have intermittent symptoms. So if they have persistent disease, they were in the ICU, I'm not probably going to use intermittent therapy, but for your standard recurrent Weezer, um, you know, I showed you the MIST study. It works pretty well. It's a good place to start. You can always tell them if this doesn't work, we can do daily. Um, I do consider daily inhaled corticosteroids. If I have somebody who has already has um, air allergen sensitization or uh, eosinophilia, and yes, I will look, especially if they have a lot of nasal symptoms, um, a child that already has persistent symptoms, um, or like I said, a, a child that's been in the ho uh, frequent hospitalization, PICU care, um, those that tend to wheeze with rhinovirus, I see this a lot because a lot of people are getting viral panels. If I see a kid that has a pattern of rhinovirus that land them in the hospital, I usually put them on daily ICS because that's a kid that's hard to control. They usually end up in the hospital a lot. Um, how about children that don't have um, allergic sensitization, eosinophilia, or asthma predictive index negative? Um, it's really unclear what the best treatment is on these, these kids. They do wheeze. Um, and azithromycin actually was shown to, to um, be beneficial in these children, even API negative children. So I do tend to use that in my children that sort of fit into that category because I know it actually works. Um, and I've had kids, um, especially with rhinovirus, um, stay out of the hospital on this, this regimen. So um, people sometimes hate me for that because of the resistance question, but I try to really reserve it just for that population, which tends to be about 20% of the population most are allergic. So um, just to let you know, the, the good work with asthma prevention is going on, and I'm actually involved in a couple of multi-center clinical uh, prevention trials that I thought I'd just toot here. Um, one is a, a primary wheezing uh, respiratory, lower respiratory tract illness prevention study using an inactive oral bacterial lysate. So what is that? It may basically take a bunch of uh, pathogenic bacteria, cook it up in a big kettle in Germany, and then they chop it all up so it becomes inactive. It can't make the child sick. Um, they sprinkle this powder on yogurt 10 days out of the month. Um, it's actually approved to use in uh, Europe for prevention of colds. Um, and we're trying to see if this, um, it sort of matures the gut microbiome is how we think this works, um, kind of matures the immune system away from uh, atopic disease. And so we're giving it to them for two years and following them for three years to see what happens to their risk of wheezing and asthma as they get older. And then there's a secondary prevention trial of a child that already has recurrent wheezing, and we're actually using Zolaire or anti-IgE therapy. Uh, once a month for two years, and then we're following them for two years to see if it impacts uh, their risk of asthma as they get older. Um, and so uh, it, clinical research takes a lot of time, but we hope to have an answer for you in a few years to see if, uh, if 
these strategies worked. So going back to our case, um, if you have allergic sensitization, um, uh, and if this kid was not allergic sensitized, he would have had a power score of nine. If he was um, sensitized with all his other risk factors, he would have had a power score of 11. So either way, he's at high risk um, and having <clears throat> either a 40 or 58% risk of having asthma by age seven. Um, if you look at uh, the asthma predictive index, he was API positive because he had four episodes of wheezing in the past year. And he had allergic, um, or he had atopic dermatitis as well as a mother with asthma. And so he has about a 65% likelihood of developing clin clinical asthma by age six. So by either risk score, that would have been a kid that um, was at risk. If he was in my clinic, how would I manage him? I'd probably either start him on intermittent inhaled corticosteroids or daily in inhaled corticosteroids after a discussion with a family, what they thought would be a better choice for them. So I'll end there and happy to take, do we have time for questions or what do you think, Eric? 